And the morning meeting is brought to you in part by Mark Platt of Edward Jones Investments in Ottawa for your investment needs. Talk with Mark Platt or Andrew Blackburn of Edward Jones, our neighbor over here at the corner of LaSalle and Lafayette Streets at the north end of Washington Square Park in beautiful downtown Ottawa. I'm Jay Lesseur. we still got uh, one item on our morning meeting agenda today, and that's going to be a conversation with Doc and, uh, Dr. Reagan Anderson here in just a moment about what we can expect if we're traveling this summer. Maggie Frost has some time to be in here for a little bit. Good morning. So. I'm telling you, weather like this, you want to travel, at least outside. Oh, we, we, we should have taken the, <laughs> we should show, the show out on the sidewalk. Yes, we've today. done that before. Yes, we yeah. have. It would have been a perfect day. Oh, today's ideal. And uh, Dr. Anderson's ready to be with us here. He so. is. Dr. Anderson's been with us before, Jay. He's the author of Universal Death Care Solution for Healthcare in the Age of Entitlement. I think he got up early to join us so we do appreciate that he's out in Colorado. Dr. Anderson, welcome back to the program. How are you? Doing great. Thank you so much for having me. You know, this, of course, is um, traveling is one of the hotbeds surrounding the coronavirus pandemic. I think it's gotten a little bit more heightened with uh, yesterday's announcement about folks sh uh, shedding masks, which actually we had this interview um, booked first. Talk a little bit. Uh, has this, uh, I don't want to say edict, uh, has this <laughs> has this ruling from the CDC changed your perspective at all about traveling? You know, it really hasn't. I think we need to be prudent and wise uh, in the face of the COVID pandemic that is still going on. Now, the numbers are going down, but we have nowhere close to herd immunity right now. And we're guessing that herd immunity is going to happen around 70% when 70% of the population is fully immune uh, from the vaccine. And, you know, right now we're only at about 35, 36% of the population being fully vaccinated. And so we've got a long way to go. And while I do really appreciate the CDC trying to keep up with the times and trying to uh, make new rules for masks, I think we need to be aware that we are not where we need to be for the pandemic and we still need to be wise and prudent in our actions. I know one of, um one of the points, one of the reasons you wrote uh, de uh, Universal Death Care was when you talk about profit-driven policies that don't support Americans' health. To me, is this the same thing? Well, I, it's a difficult thing because in America we have a bunch of different states getting to decide uh, their own facts or getting to interpret the facts their own way to suit their own political agendas. I promise you that the COVID vaccine does not care one way or another whether you're Republican or Democrat. Mm. And so I do think it's really important to get the economy back up and get it healthy again. But I also think that we need to do everything that we can to get that happening. So people saying, oh, the vaccine isn't real, well, that's just not true. Uh, saying that the virus itself isn't real, well, that's not true. We need to stop trying to find the articles and the news sources that support our point of view, the one out of a thousand that support our point of view, and then put everybody else at risk. It's just not appropriate. And this entitlement that we feel as Americans, uh, especially towards health care, it, it needs to stop. And when it comes to defining herd immunity, because I've, I've never found a definitive answer for this when you look at all those thousands of articles out there. I mean, some of us have had COVID. We've still got the antibody. Aren't we part of the herd immunity population? The answer for all of this is we are not quite sure yet. So this is a new thing. And people need to understand how science works. So science works by getting a lot of information and then trying to make sense of that information in a non-political way. So we think that you have immunity for the average person that will last for a couple of months after COVID and you're relatively immune. It's kind of like after pregnancy, you probably are relatively safe from not getting pregnant again for 30 to 60 days. But everybody's a little bit different and we all know this and we all know that surprise pregnancies happen, you know, 20, 30 days after uh, a woman has given birth. The same thing is gonna be true with COVID. There are going to be people who, after having COVID, will be immune from getting another uh, infection with COVID for six, nine, 12 months. And there are going to be some people who, a month or two later, 
are going to be able to get reinfected with COVID again. It all depends on your immune system, how bad of a case you had. There's multiple, multiple variables, nutritional status, other comorbidities. And so I think for people to just say, well, I had COVID eight months ago, I'm good forever. I think that's misleading. And until we actually are testing people's antibodies to see how, how many antibodies they still have to COVID, I don't think that you can just rely on an uh, infection in the far past to say that you're immune. Now, here's the other thing with herd immunity. Herd immunity, we tend to think of herd immunity as those people who surround us, just the people who in our close-knit families, our close-knit uh, workers, but that's not really herd immunity. That's kind of like micro herd immunity, but the real herd immunity is everybody around us in the entire community. And until the entire community gets an immunization or immunity rate of above 70%, and I personally think that with COVID, with the variants, it's probably going to be closer to 80%. We won't, will not really be quote unquote protected by herd immunity until we get up to those higher numbers. With those higher numbers, how can we have any confidence in that, given the fact that the virus, we've seen instances where it has mutated, I would have to expect there will be more mutations. How do we get a, a, com a level of comfort about th the rest of the population in our community? Well, that's the whole thing. You, you don't. So you don't say, hey, everybody else on the road is going to drive safe, so I'm going to... Uh, text and do my hair and read a book at the same time because everybody else is going to protect me. No, you keep your eyes on the road. You keep your head on a swivel and, and you practice defensive driving. We need to practice defensive medicine uh, right now, each and every one of us. We have to assume that the person that we're walking next to in the hall or in the grocery store or wherever is horribly immunocompromised. And if we don't do our part to get the vaccine, we could literally be the vector of an infection that kills them. So the, the point is, guys, please don't just lower your guard. Yes, we are loosening some restrictions as more and more data comes out and as more and more uh, people get the vaccine. But that doesn't mean that we get to say, woohoo, we're all good. We can do whatever we want. That's just not smart. The other thing that I would say to people is, you know, to be a good driver, you have to have the information on what all the rules are. All everybody, everybody in America has been asked to become uh, an infectious disease doctor in the last uh, in the last year. With that, we need to really have good sources, and there are great sources out there. One, for instance, is uh, Doctorpedia does a weekly webinar where they give you the most up-to-date, non-biased, non-political information out there. It's a free webinar, uh, and it's a great source. So I'm asking people to get their information from good sources. And then to, to not uh, drive while texting and reading a book at the same time as that relates to COVID. Just please be reasonable. Let's talk about summer travel a little bit. And I'll be honest with you, the last thing I want to get on right now is an aluminum tube that flies through the sky. So I'd rather book a longer vacation and drive where I want to go. Do I have an unfounded fear of getting on a jet aircraft right now? Well, I think that there's an appropriate level of fear and an appropriate level of risk for any activity that we're doing right now. Uh, the, the FAA and the CDC have made some pretty good guidelines for travel. So and you can go to the CDC and look them up. I don't think you should fear traveling in America if you're wearing a mask and if you've been fully immunized, which means two weeks after the vaccination course has been complete. So if you wear your mask and you're smart and you wash your hands and you're fully immunized, I think you can get on a plane and travel within America. International travel is a, kind of a sticky wicket because to get back into America, you have to get a negative COVID test one to three days prior to getting back on the plane. And if you are found to be having COVID, you have to quarantine for two weeks and then get another negative test before you get back on the plane. So I think it's wise to for all of us to realize that we need a vacation after the last 14, 15 months that we've had. But I think that also there's a lot of destinations within driving distance that can satisfy that itch and to our need to recharge. So I would prefer people drive so that if something happens, they can simply drive home instead of getting on a plane. 
but I'm not sure we should overly fear airplane travel right now. When did people start getting vaccinated? That was right after the first of the year, was it not? Well, there were some in December, but around okay. that time frame, yes. And, and, and do we know yet, definitively, or even in a ballpark manner, uh, how long this vaccine is good for? No, we really don't, because realize uh, a year ago, we didn't have any vaccines really right now. So we think that the vaccine is going to be at least good for nine months from the studies that we have, whether that's, uh, and when I'm talking about the Pfizer and the Moderna, the mRNA. Uh, we don't have this data, as much data on the J&J for longevity yet. But we're thinking that it lasts at least six to nine months. And I'm guessing that the data is going to show that these viruses last for, or sorry, these vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, last for approximately a year or longer. And then we'll need a booster dose. So what I'm guessing is going to happen is just like with the seasonal flu and the flu vaccine, uh, once a year we'll get a booster dose for COVID and the new variants. And that's just going to be all part of the cocktail for our, our seasonal flu vaccine. But these, these couldn't be combined, or maybe they could, uh, with the seasonal flu vaccine. Because this is, I guess, what they call gene therapy. Am I understanding that right? And what is gene therapy as opposed to that flu vaccine a lot of people get every year? Well, so the vaccines, we have multiple different vaccines out there. Some of the vaccines that we put into our arm are just simply proteins that come off of the top of uh, a flu or the flu uh, virus or any sort of virus. And what that does is our body recognizes these foreign proteins and it mounts an immune response. So that is one type of virus we, uh, or vaccine we have. We have other types of vaccines like these new mRNA vaccines where the body actually makes those proteins and then our body reacts to those proteins. Now, the mRNA, what happens is it goes into your body, and it has very short-lived. It makes our body make proteins. Our body recognizes those proteins and then mounts an immune response to it. So this whole notion that uh, these vaccines are changing your DNA uh, is it's just false. Uh, so we have multiple different vaccines, and how we're going to progress in the future uh, for the flu and for COVID, I, I don't know. We might use kind of the flu vaccine technology. We might do mRNA technology like these new vaccines are for COVID for both. I'm not sure how it's going to work. I don't know why we couldn't put everything in one shot. Uh, perhaps it's going to be two shots that you get at the same time. Perhaps they're going to be two weeks apart. I don't know how it's all going to shake out. But I do know it's important that we do our part to keep ourselves safe and to keep those around us safe. And then one more question for me, because I know Maggie's got a couple of things she wants to ask, because we, we just had the story this morning on one of the sports casts that there's a member of the New York Yankees that's been uh, sidelined again because he's come down with COVID after being vaccinated. Uh, and I guess sure. these are called breakthrough cases. What do we know about these and why is that happening? Well, you have to realize that nothing is 100 percent in life. So you, you can't say that the, vi the virus is going to be completely eliminated by the vaccine. What we do know is that the J&J &J vaccine is about 70% effective from preventing severe disease, and the Moderna and Pfizer's are about 95% effective. That means there will be some breakthrough cases. Now, these breakthrough cases, for the most part, are not producing serious hospitalizations or serious diseases and that's what we want we want uh, when we get the flu let's go back to the flu because we're more familiar with it when the flu is out there and we get the flu vaccine we know that the flu vaccine is not a hundred percent we know that it's going to uh, hopefully they guess the right uh, viruses for that flu vaccine and when we get infected with the flu from somebody else our body mounts an immune response now, yes, there's a number of people who will get slightly sick after vaccination, but the point is to help them not die from the virus. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to help people not die. I don't know about you, but I am around people all day long. I'm a physician. So the chances of me being exposed to COVID are higher than the average bear. 
I know that since I'm fully vaccinated and it's two weeks, more than two weeks after my second dose, that when that virus hits my system, my immune system is going to ramp up and it's going to fight it. Now, I might not feel a single thing. I might feel a little fatigued. I might feel a little sick, but I should not statistically be so sick that I'm dying in the hospital. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. No, that's a great explanation. Thank you. Yeah. No, yeah, did, and, did. and so they're testing, they're testing the Yankees, and they're testing these people to see. So some of these people who are getting positive tests, they have zero idea that they're even sick because their body is fighting it, and they're not going to wind up in the hospital, which is what we want. To, to wrap this up as we talk to Dr. Reagan Anderson, um, common sense precautions, the key being common sense, is that enough to keep us safe? as we travel? Absolutely. If that includes getting the vaccine, if that includes wearing your mask, if that includes trying to socially distance, if that includes, you know, fill in the common sense thing. Don't lick doorknobs. I mean, come on, people. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that with it's a been little a long bit year. of humor. <laughs> yeah, I say that with a little bit of humor, but licking a doorknob makes about as much sense as not getting a vaccine. I mean, we, these things are safe. We know through the history of making vaccines that within two months, we know of getting immunized that almost every major serious side effect happens from getting a vaccine. Well, these vaccines have been out for months and months now. Over 250 million doses have been given in America alone. And we know that they are safe. We know that the J&J &J vaccine is very, very safe. Now, for some people, for some women, younger than 50, there's a slight increased risk of blood clots. Fine. Go out and get the Moderna or the Pfizer. For anybody over 50, get anyone you want. You're going to be protected. I'm just asking people to, to not let their fear get in the way of protecting themselves and their loved ones. Because even me as a physician, I do not know if my wife is fighting a cancer right now that nobody's detected. And if I just say, oh, I'm just not going to give it, everybody's healthy, you don't know that. <laughs> and I don't think any of us want someone else's death on our hands. No. I'm, I'm just sitting here because uh, you talked about the, you know, the, the risk of blood cuts and the, the fear some folks have. And I'm sitting here thinking, OK, those pharmaceutical commercials that we hear on television uh, and, you know, they've got 60 seconds to work with. And 20 seconds of it at the tail end of the ad is about all the side all the effects. Yeah. And, oh, and yeah. I sit there and I think, I'm not going to take that pill. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, it's crazy because I know a number of my patients uh, who I love and respect. But a number of them smoke, and they've actually told me, I'm not putting that stuff into my body. And I'm like, are you insane? <laughs> hey, look at what you're smoking. You have over a 1,000 known carcinogens or cancer-causing agents that you are ingesting into your lungs multiple times a day, and you're worried about an enormously safe vaccine that could literally save your life and the life of your loved ones? I mean, common sense people don't lick doorknobs and get a vaccine. Okay. That's, that's, the, that's the general thing. Well, bottom line is uh, just uh, common sense if you're going to travel this summer. Yes. That's really uh, Absolutely. what it's all about. Absolutely. Uh, the book's still out, uh, Universal Death Care. Is that right? It's still out there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, it's called Universal Death Care, A Solution for Health Care in the Age of Entitlement. It's by Dr. Reagan B. Anderson. And... Uh, we appreciate the time today, and I'm sure we'll talk to you again. We, Thank you. We, we always enjoy it. It's an honor. Thank you both. Thank you. All right. It's the morning meeting here, 1430 WCMY and 1430 WCMY.com.